Okay, so my name is Flaminia. I work in the University of Vienna and I will be the chair of the next session. And we will now hear the last lecture of Leandro Olita. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody. I hope you had a nice party last night. I, um, I would have liked to come, but I had some slides to prepare. So, <laughs> so I had to stay home uh, till late. Um, right, so, um, so today we will... F huh? Thank you. <laughs> um, right, so let's continue. So this is the second part um, of the quantum certification talk. So I would like to, to just to, to refresh, let's say, what, what we discussed last time. Um, so first of all, we, uh, w let's say we identified at least three uh, reasons why quantum certification is an should, should be an interesting field, at least for some, some part of the community. Um, we discussed that further progress in many body quantum technologies is, 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 is difficult if you don't have practical and reliable certification tools. So the technologies are getting much, 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 much better. The standards are, are getting much higher. So therefore, we need more stringent certification techniques. It's not just, you know, we've been doing just entanglement certification for like a decade or two, and we need to certify other, let's say, um, more interesting properties of the system if you want to. Um, then certifying, so from the fundamental point of view, certifying many body quantum devices is a little bit about testing quantum mechanics in unexplored regimes. It's about testing the description of your, of your system for in, in, in high complexity, many, many body particle regimes. And then we, we talked a little bit about quantum certification as an instance of quantum supremacy, as, as examples of, of tasks that you can solve better when you give more quantum resources to the certifier than when the certifier has only classical resources. Uh, we define, we identified quantum, quantum output sampling problems as the natural problems to certify. So these, these problems have been mentioned yesterday and before yesterday also. Um, and these are the natural problems that, uh, that, that you have to ask to, 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 a quantum, to a quantum computer or a quantum simulator. And therefore the problems that you, have to, that, that you should expect to certify. And then we reviewed the history of, of, of tomographic reconstruction, started from f for starting from full tomography, going through compressed sensing, uh, permutational invariant tomography, and MPS tomography, finally. And then we discussed <coughs> direct fidelity estimation techniques, which um, aim to estimate the fidelity between a given target state and that, that you know and an unknown experimental preparation without going through the reconstruction of the experimental preparation. We saw that there are two problems with that, that typically this works with, with, with this requires only a, a constant number of observables to measure, but it can happen that, um, that the, 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 the experimental precision that you need in the estimation of each expectation value is, it needs to be so large that it requires a, an exponential uh, number of samples. This, this, this can happen. Um, so each has so each technique has its own advantages and disadvantages. We're still far away from having something fully satisfactory. And, uh, and, but there are some advances that have been done in the last three or four years. And today I, will, I would like to focus on, that, on those advances. Um, <clears throat> so, so the outline of today will be, well, first of all, I will introduce like what's the general mindset of quantum state certification and also uh, different paradigms of quantum state certification. So this will regard the definition, the, the formal definition. So I've been already anticipating uh, what it should be, what a, what a quantum certification test should be, but today we will define it formally. And then we, I will focus on es essentially on two things. So interactive certification tests and non-interactive certification tests. I will, I will define that <coughs> later. And I hope I have some time for some, com for, for, well, for conclusions and some perspectives of the field. Um, so yeah, so quantum state certification, that's, that's, that's the topic. Um, so this is the general mindset. Um, so typically, so this is a, this is a mindset that, that we inherit from, for, from something that, that appeared first in the, uh, in the classical, so in, from, from classical computer science, which is called interactive proofs. 
and um, and and the mindset of interaction of interactive proofs is the following: this, the, the, there are two players, right? So these two players are some. Well, they're, now they are called Alice and Bob, but in the beginning, for for from for, for quantum computer quantum quantum computer science and uh, for computer scientists, they were uh, Arthur and Merlin. Uh, sorry, Arthur and the magician Merlin. And there is a reason. <coughs> so the idea is that so. Merlin is a magician. He's almighty. He has uh, lots of uh, computing power. He can prepare uh, crazy states. He can, he can do his, he can do many many things. Uh, like many, so that that to Arthur, who's just a mortal and and, and 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 a poor guy, they look like magic. So ideally, we would like to have like a classical. So Arthur is the certifier, and 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 Merlin is the, the, the prover. He's untrusted. So Arthur doesn't trust Merlin, and he would like to get. So Arthur would like to get convinced that that Merlin is doing something that Arthur wants him to do, right? So that's that's the general mindset, and he's totally untrusted. And typically, you want to assume as few things. So you want to impose as few restrictions as possible to to Merlin, and you want to allow like as much computational power as possible here, and as little as possible here. So ideally, you would like. Arthur to have just a classical computer, but with that there is very little that he can do. So you give him some quantum power, right? So depending on the case, we will see that here we might give him only uh, the capability to implement single particle measurements, or the capability to implement single particle measurements plus the preparation of single particle states, or perhaps like a little finite size uh, quantum quantum computer so that he can implement two qubit gates but not more than that at a time and 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 like that and they exchange and and you know in general they can exchange information right so here um, merlin has like a, like his black box arthur doesn't doesn't know what this what, what's inside this black box and they exchange messages these messages can be uh, uh, quantum states or, or or classical states they can exchange classical information and quantum information and the idea is that they run a computation, but in, but in an interactive fashion, in such a way that in the end of the day, Arthur gets convinced by by, by Merlin. So if if there, there is like this, always involves some some kind of test, and when when Merlin passes the test, then Arthur gets convinced that Merlin has implemented the computation Arthur wanted to, and that it and he has done it correctly. That's like the general the general mindset, and and there are many. So so th there's like a history, right? So I mean. This started with, uh, with with classical computer science science in the 80s, and then uh, so the first uh, quantum interactive proofs appeared in the early 2000s. So the first, I think, the first one to define that was uh, John Watros, and uh, and there, but but this was like this this was what what was called QIP, um, so quantum interactive proofs, but they referred to an unbounded quantum prover and a BQP certifier. So in that case, so Merlin was totally unbounded. He had totally unbounded quantum power and everything. But Arthur uh, was restricted to have a universal classical com uh, quantum computer. And then people studied what are the classes of problems that can be certified efficiently when, 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 when Arthur has a, a universal quantum computer. So this is like an academic problem, right? We don't want Arthur to have a quantum computer. As I was saying, you want ideally you want him just to have a classical computer and some little quantum resources so that at least he can make measurements or prepare single single particle states. So then people came up with the idea of quantum prover interactive proofs. So these are these are a different kind of interactive proofs in which now you say okay the the, the prover is not doesn't have unlimited quantum power. He's restricted to solve BQP problems. So essentially he has a universal he has a universal quantum computer, but now you, s you impose that the certifier should be almost classical. So in this series of works, people consider the case where, 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 um, where Arthur, as I, was, as I said, he has um, a classical computer plus the ability to measure or prepare single qubit states or to act on two qubits at a time and things like that. So that's what they call, like, that's, that's, that's what they refer to as almost classical, right? He cannot solve BQB problems, but he has some quantum resources. And then this is this is all, again very nice, but we, so I will talk about it a little bit, and and, and we will see that it's a super, uh, is this a really elegant results? But in a sense, it's a bit of, so. This this typically these results are super powerful in the sense that you can certify, uh, let's say, 
more complex classes of, of, of problems than the ones you can certify without interacting. But the problem is, of course, that they are, they are, so they are way out, out of reach for experimental technology that we have today. I mean, we, we, we don't, we're very far away from, from a universal quantum computer. So there is the more practical approach, which is, um, well, non-interactive test, in which you say, okay, so the certified, instead of exchanging many messages, the certifier just sends a classical input. So actually there is, a, so here I, I, I am abusing notation uh, or abusing terminology a little bit because I say non-interactive test, but of course there has to be at least one interaction, right? So, so the certifier has to ask the, the prover something, he, uh, prepare such state, do something. I mean, he has to give some, in, some instruction and then the prover has to return something back so that the certifier can check, right? So this is the only interaction. So I will refer to such tests as non-interactive tests, but actually um, uh, computer science people would call that a quantum prover interactive uh, proof with a single message exchange. So that some people call it QPIP1. Okay, this one refers to a single exchange. Whatever. I mean, I, 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 today, I, I, I mean, I would like to give like a physical approach to the problem. And uh, so, um, so yeah, so there are many schemes. So, so here in, in the reference here, I also list the references about fidelity estimation techniques that we talked about last, last time, and also some new schemes that have been developed uh, recently. Uh, so I mean, many schemes can be put, can be rephrased in terms of, 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 this, of this framework. The problem is how efficient they are, so we saw that with fide direct fidelity estimation techniques that are efficiency problem, not only computational efficiency, but also in terms of the sample complexity of the problem, how many times you have to prepare the state, right? But anyway, they all can be grouped together in this, in this side of, the, of this slide, if you want to. And of course, the reason why are we interested in this approach, which is less powerful? Well, because we can implement, we want to do something that might be uh, implementable in the lab, right? So that's a general mindset, and uh, and there, so so yeah. So as I said, Arthur g wants to get convinced by Merlin that Merlin is doing something that he wants, right? So how does he get convinced? Well, I mean, the figure of oh, sorry, um, wait, yeah. So so the figure of merit, um, the f so a good figure of merit for, for, for him to get convinced is the fidelity, right? So remember that the notation I'm using is rho t is um, the target state. It's a pure target state, typically a many-body pure target state that he knows. And then you have an experimental preparation which is absolutely arbitrary, right? So it's unknown and can be anything, but you assume that it's a quantum state. Um, and then, uh, well, of course, for pure states, then you can write rho t as, as a tensor product of, of these vector states, and uh, and, yeah, and and the fidelity takes this simpler form, and this can always be thought as some as let's say so you can term you can think of this as the, the fidelity is equivalent to one minus the probability of an incorrect outcome. So say that you know you, you find you're correct that this makes sense also in the classical computation uh, scenario and as as well as in oh. Uh, as well as in the quantum one. So, I mean, if you define the, the, the correct output as, as being your target state, then um, this writes like this, and this is the projector onto, onto the subspace orthogonal to the ideal output, right? So, let's say that you want a classical, so let's say that you, you, your sampling problem has classical outputs, and I don't know, the correct output was 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. Well, then this, the, the, this quantifies the probability that you don't get 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, but you get some, 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 some different string, right? And it makes sense also in the quantum sense. So, I mean, uh, people, people, I mean, to see, yeah, some, so you will see that some papers talk about the fidelity, some papers talk about the, the, the probability of incorrect output. It's essentially the same thing. Um, so, and yeah, well, of course, it has the advantage. That, so the fidelity can be related also to, to, to formal uh, uh, state distances, right? So, uh, in st so in state space, a nice distance that, um, that, that theor theoreticians like is the, the one norm distance, the trace distance, which is defined like this. And uh, there are inequalities that relate, that relate the fidelity with the, with the trace distance. So when, the, when, the state, when, when one of the state is pure, they satisfy this inequality, which is, which is quite tight. So where you can, you know, talking about the fidelity, 
is is also it can be related to more formal distances from if you want to with with more let's say more mathematical so so it's so it's it's, it's quite satisfactory so this is the figure of merit that 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 Arthur will use to get convinced that Merlin is is, is preparing the right output that he wants right so <coughs> uh, so the thing is that so last time so I, so let, let let's let's go back again a, a little bit so we started talking about tomography and 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 talked about yeah okay so this this is useful to reconstruct the full state but then we thought then we said well it's 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 not really what we want it's a bit too much reconstructing the full state so why don't we just why don't we estimate the fidelity directly okay so we did that and we saw that it has its advantages and disadvantages but actually estimating the 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 precise value of the fidelity is still too much we don't want that so i'm not interested so let's say in certif so so an experimentalist is not really I mean, for for certification, for the sake of cert certification, is 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 also too much to estimate the, the exact value of the fidelity. It's enough. I mean, it's in, I mean, in the end of the day, all you want all you want to guarantee is that the fidelity between your unknown preparation and target state is uh, above a certain fidelity threshold. That's that's all you want to know, right? So I mean, let's say it's not. I mean, of course, it would be better to know the fidelity. It would be better to reconstruct the state, but this requires higher sample complexity, right? It requires to prepare more times the preparation, right? So we want we want to we want to identify like the least we can ask to the to, to, to so so we want to ha we want to have a scheme we want to have an experimental scheme that identifies the least we can ask. To, to, to the, the, let's say the, the, the minimum amount of information from the uh, experimental preparation to get convinced that the preparation is valid. Right? So all we need is just to know whether the fidelity is above a certain threshold or not. I don't care exactly well the fidelity. So so how, how 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 what the exact value of the fidelity is. I just want to know that it's above a certain threshold. And ideally, so this would be like the experimental stream. Ideally, you would like a scheme that is able to 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 to, to decide whether um, the preparation lies in this red region of fidelity lower than the threshold or inside this this ball of fidelity uh, larger or equal than the threshold but this is infeasible so you know like experimental accuracy computing uh, precision i mean if i find you a preparation that lies close to the border then uh, no no scheme will ever decide that so i mean this is this is like the naive approach and it's infeasible due to finite precision and uh, so therefore I mean, the ideal scenario is something is, is some experimental scheme that does that that solves the following this the following decision problem, one in which you say okay, um, so I mean here you say well um, if it's uh, you I want to know if it's in the red region and or if it's inside this gray region, but all I demand to my test is that it necessarily accepts states that are inside this um, inside this inner ball here. Where I have introduced a fidelity gap delta, right? So this is this is a more feasible, uh, let's say, uh, or the, there is hope that this exists. And uh, and notice that, the, I mean, um, so the fact, let's say, all I want to know is that if the fidelity is not in the red region, right? So I mean, it it doesn't. This doesn't mean that if I am in the gray region, uh, uh, the, the 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 test will not accept it. I mean, it will. Sometimes it will accept it, sometimes it will reject, but what you demand is at least that it should accept the ones that are inside of here. Right? That's, that's the condition that you ask. And then there is a third paradigm, which is, let's say, the more practical one, in which you, in which you say, well, at least you should accept the, 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 the target state. Right? When you, I mean, it's not enough. If we have an experimental scheme that rejects all invalid states, it's not enough. I mean, I can, ask you, I, I can give you a very easy experimental test that rejects all states, and that would qualify as a certification test if I don't impose that at least the the, the, the ideal the ideal preparation should be accepted, right? So notice that again, I'm not saying that. So so we, what we this are, these are the two defining conditions that we will ask. We will ask that uh, preparations with fidelity lower than the threshold be necessarily rejected, and ideal preparations should also be necessarily accepted. This doesn't mean that only the Perfect ideal preparations will be accepted. You, you, you demand that at least they should be accepted, right? So these are the, the, the let's say the three uh, paradigms that, that 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 let's say that we we def let's say we define as the, the certification paradigms, and um, yeah. So so now let me talk about 
the, the, the let's say known techniques that 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 fall into this into this paradigm of certification, right? So the first one are interactive tests, and uh, so these are the quantum prover interactive proofs that I was that, that I was talking about in the in the beginning. And here you have a BQP prover that can efficiently convince an almost classical certifier. Uh, so this is nice, but of course the, 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 the obvious disadvantage is that this is like an, a, a nice academic solution if you want to, but it's still academic. We need a universal quantum computer to implement that. We need full error correction. And furthermore, furthermore you also need, um, you need interactive, you need to interact with a machine. Right, you need quantum interaction between the quantum prover and the and the almost classical certifier. So this is highly non-trivial from the experimental point of view. Um, um, right. So there are at least two flavors of this thing. So one is so the measurement-based quantum computer approach, and also the other like certifier with a constant size quantum computer. So these are at least these uh, two families of of interactive proofs, and and in this <coughs> so in this approach. So I, I will I will I will show this approach into some detail. Uh, both approaches are essentially equivalent in, in terms of the statements that they, that they do, but they take different paths to show the results. And, and in this one, uh, the certifier, so, so you have a prover that he has, he has like, a, like a huge quantum memory and he can store cluster states. He can, he can store, <laughs> he can store any states you, he, he wants and the certifier, the only thing he does is to send him single qubit states which eventually encode some traps to test the, 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 the prover. We, 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 will, we will see that into some detail. But, the, the, but then one, once the, the, the certifier sends him this, this, the states and also some traps, the prover stores the cluster state, but he does it blindly without, no, without knowing exactly which cluster state he has, in which basis it's written. And he only implements measurements. So he runs a measurement-based quantum computation without knowing exactly which clusters he which cluster he has, and without knowing exactly which effective measurements he's doing, because he measures in random directions that that are instructed uh, that are given by the certifier, uh, but he doesn't know to which actual measurement that corresponds, because he doesn't know in which basis the cluster is written, and with that, <coughs> um, so you can achieve certification. Let's say you can you can certify. Uh, universal quantum computations. The other approach is uh, one in which, well, again, the prover has he, can st he has a huge quantum memory, and he can store any quantum state you want. Uh, and the certifier now sends him authenticated qubits. So, authentic authentication codes are codes such that if you have a qubit, <coughs> you apply some, you, you put some ancillas, you you. you you join some ancillas to it and apply some random unitary in such a way that, well, if I give this authenticated encoded state to you, this looks random to you and you don't know nothing. But then if I, if I take it at a later time and I and undo the, the random unitary that I applied because I knew which unitary I applied, then you, have, then, then you check the state of the ancillas that you, that, that you added and if the state of the ancillas is correct, is the, the one that you, that you use in the initialization, then the probability that there has occurred some error in the actual qubit then it's very small. So this is a, a, an authentication. This is an authentication code. It's related to cryptography, right? But the thing is that so the, 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 the idea here is that the the certifier authenticates qubits, sends them to the to the prover. The prover either applies some gates that the certifier instructs him to, or simply stores all the qubits and then send them back to the certifier who just applies two qubits. So the certifier de-authenticates the state. He knows he, which, unit, which unitary he used. And if it's correct, he applies the gate, authenticates it again, send it back to, to, to the prover, and ask for another, for another uh, authenticated qubit to, to the prover, and, and, it, and iterates this process, right? So I mean, um, these are techniques that, 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 as I was saying, can certify any universal quantum computation, right? I will show, so we don't have time to go through the details of both, I will show this one because I think that for, for, for physicists and, and people working in, in, in let's say, in, in quantum optics and quantum information, this is more familiar because it's related to a known model, the measurement-based quantum computer and one, right? Um, so in this scheme, um, so this is a measurement-based scheme, right? Uh, so, so first, let me let me review what is the conventional measurement-based quantum computation model, right? So, he, the, this was proposed in 2001, and 
and, and, and the nice feature about this type of computation is that, is that information is processed by local measurements on a cluster state. So a cluster state is a multi-particle is a multi-particle entangled state um, uh, that 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 let's say that um, to which if I apply single qubit me measurements, uh, I can implement actually any. Uh, so I mean. Here, it's like a rectangular arrangement, and I start I start making making measurements from from this side to this side, and there is an information flow from left to right, and eventually I can implement. The, so, choosing the uh, the the measurement basis, I can I can I can choose to sort of disconnect some qubits from the cluster state, and on the other ones that are connected, I I make measurements on different directions that propagate direction forward. And of course, I, I I need adaptability, which was also mentioned yesterday. So I mean, uh, this this there is lots of randomness being produced everywhere because of course I'm measuring quantum states, but then I can by adapting the, the the direction of the next measurement, I can counteract that randomness, and in the end, people show that you can prepare any quantum state at the output here. But of course, <coughs> I mean, if you look at the measurement pattern, so here, for instance, in white, you're measuring in the Z basis that disconnect the qubits from the cluster, and here you measure in the X basis or some other direction in the in the equatorial plane of the block sphere. And uh, if from from the outside I look at the measurement at the measurement settings, I r I have some idea of what's going on. I know that well here these are disconnected, the yellow ones are connected, and this essentially tell, tells me something about the underlying circuit qubit, right? So you know that there are two big models of, of quantum computation. One is the measurement base, the other, is, the other one is the circuit based model. And by looking at the measurement pattern, I obtain some information about the underlying circuit that describes the, the, the quantum computation, if you want to. So of course, here I can tell that there is a, a control gate being implemented into this line and this line, which represent two different qubits. And here there is another control gate being implemented here. Here there is a measurement in a, in a direction of the, so between the x and y, so in the equatorial plane, so I can s I can see that here there is some local phase being implemented and such things, right? So the idea of blind measurement blind measurement based quantum computer is that the me so so here so here is Alice and Bob. I didn't have time to make another nice drawing, right? So Alice is now Arthur, and and Bob, his blind is 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 the prover. He's uh, Merlin, right? But the the idea here is that um, so the measurement graph. Is hidden to Merlin. So imagine they, they they do the same. So so Merlin here has the has the graph, and uh, and Alice sends so Alice sends sends him qubits, and all he does is just to make measurements in directions instructed by her, and sends classical outputs back to her. Right. That, that, that's that's the general the general view of of blind blind quantum computation, and and uh, and yeah, and the, and the trick is to make it in such a way that he doesn't see which graph he has. And if he doesn't see which graph he does, then um, he's, he's performing measurements in the direction that, that, that to him they look random, but that can hide uh, that can hide traps, right? So I, I will show I will show how this how this trick works. So first, I need to 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 to, to devote a slide to the definition of a graph graph state, right? So this will take me a minute. So a graph state um, has vertices. Uh, connected by a pattern of edges, right? So that's a mathematical graph, a set of vertices connected by edges. And uh, the quantum graph state is a state to which, uh, to, to, in which to each vertex you associate a qubit initially in a superposition of zero plus one. So I'm talking about qubits now, but this can also be generalized to qubits and even to continuous variable systems. But yeah, you associate to each vertex, you associate a qubit uh, in the superposition zero plus one, and you apply a control Z to each pair of connected vertices. So here, I don't know, there is a five particle graph. So I initialize all five qubits in the, in the plus state and I apply a control Z to, well, one and five that are connected here, but not to one and two because it's not in this pattern, right? So I apply as many control Z gates here as, as connections here. And the cluster state is a particular instance of a graph state in which uh, you have a rectangular arrangement. And this has been shown to be universal for measurement-based quantum computer. Now, the, the the observation is that if a qubit is initialized, so say that I want I, I repeat the same scheme, but instead of of initializing the the, the, the first qubit in the plus state, I, I initialize it in the zero or in the one. So any state in the in the uh, computational basis, this will not get entangled, 
with the rest of the system, right? Because the control Z acting on an eigenstate of the Z basis does nothing. The most it can, at most it can just apply a global phase, but it will, it will not create entanglement between this qubit and the rest. And so this is a crucial observation. If I, if I have a cluster state, and every, so I mean, if, if uh, sorry, if I have a, a rectangular arrangement of qubits, each one initializing in the state plus, and I apply control sets everywhere, I obtain a cluster state. But if some of the particles are initially in, 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 in an eigenstate of Z, then the control Z will act on it as simply as a global face, and this will not get, get, get entangled. You will have like holes. You will have a cluster state with holes inside. And this is the crucial trick. That's the way, so, I mean, the, 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 um, the protocol, Goes, goes more or less like this, right? So depending on the computation she wants to do, so, so, so that, that Arthur wants to do, he chooses a given graph. And then he also prepares uh, three types of qubits. So what is called the input qubits, the dummy qubits, and the traps. So the input and the traps are given by superpositions of zero and, zeros and ones, but with, with faces phi, uh, phi, ni, or, or, or theta ni. And, uh, and then there is the dummy, so the dummy states are simply, um, so eigenstates of the, so of the of computational states, so let's say in the, of the Z basis, right? And, and, and this Z ni is also chosen randomly, so everything is chosen randomly, right? So this can be zero or one with, uh, with probability one half, and then these angles are also chosen randomly for a, from, a, from a finite set of, of angles. And then, um, so the inputs encode the computation, right? So let's say I, I, the, the inputs will, will be the, the, the effective states that will create the cluster, on the effective cluster on which, on which uh, the prover will be, will be computing. And the dummy states, the only thing they do is to isolate, to isolate the traps. So by that I mean, imagine that I, have, I, I, want, to, I, want, to send, I want to send Merlin a, a, a trap and the trap is a state in the block sphere that I know which one it is, but it's not exactly a superposition plus. So then what I do is I surround it by dummy qubits, and the dummy qubits will not get entangled with the rest of the graph, and therefore what's inside of them will also not get entangled with the rest of the graph. So essentially, whenever, whenever, whenever the certifier wants to send the trap to the prover, he surrounds it by, by, by dummy qubits in such a way as to isolate the trap there. And of course, since everything's encoded, so except for the dummies, everything's encoded in, 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 in random bases, and also the measurements that, he, that the, the certifier will instruct the prover will also be, will also be random. So the, the, the prover doesn't realize where the traps, where the traps and the dummies are, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the whole trick about blind quantum computation. And, and, uh, and like that, he can, well, he proceeds like, like like he proceeds as follows. So, so Arthur sends the graph to. So he says, okay, he he sends the classical information of who, what should be connected with what, and he sends the qubits to Merlin. But Merlin doesn't know in which basis they come, right? Because I mean, otherwise, I mean, he can measure, but then he will destroy the qubit. And in the end, by measuring, when whenever so the, the, the when 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 the certifier will see the outcome on the traps, he will realize if the brewer is is doing something wrong or not. So, the, the, so Merlin applies all the control sets according to this graph, and Merlin measures each qubit in a given basis that uh, is instructed by Arthur and returns the, out, the classical output. And with that classical output, then um, the, 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 the certifier decides in which basis the next measurement will be done, and so on. So that's the, adaptative, the adaptativeness required for measurement-based quantum computing, right? But uh, so. This is what happens, you know. So, uh, so Arthur knows where the traps are. So, and 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 the tr and in the traps, he knows exactly. So he instructs to he instructs Merlin to make the right measurement on the given angle, and he knows that if Merlin did, did things right, then he knows what the what the outcome should be, and if the outcome if the outcome is wrong, then two things can have happened. So uh, there is noise. Or Merlin is cheating. Merlin is doing something different, right? The whole trick is to isolate the, the traps with, with dummy qubits in such a way as not to get them entangled, and then you can make a measurement that you know which, who, 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 whose outcome you know. That's the whole trick. By doing that, um, they can prove 
that uh, the probability of an incorrect outcome is, I'm running out of, uh, uh, the probability of an, of an incorrect outcome here is upper bounded by, uh, by some quantity that depends on the number of traps and the, num and the total number of qubits. It also depends on, the, on, the, on, on some constant parameters of the, of the error correction code that you, chose, that you choose, but essentially this is some, some, some small integer number, and uh, you can see that you can, you, let's say you can achieve a constant uh, uh, probability, of probability of incorrect outcome by choosing a constant ratio between the traps and the total number of qubits, essentially. Uh, no, remember that this is equivalent to the fidelity being larger than one minus epsilon, right? So these are the two formulations, and and of course the nice thing is that they can achieve universal quantum comp computation certification with that. But as I was saying, this is a little bit like an academic solution to the problem because in practice this is so. So there have there has been proof of principle. Uh, I should say that. Uh, the, the, there have been proof of principle experimental demonstrations in the group of Philip in Vienna, uh, but they are restricted to, to very very few particles. And uh, and you know in the long term, uh, so I mean we still have a long way until we can implement things like that uh, non-trivially, right? So for the moment, this I think that th these are beautiful results, but for the moment, it's not really what we need. Uh, so. That's the question. Can we try something simpler for non-universal machines? We don't want to use a whole quantum interactive proof to certify a non-universal machine. It's like it's a bit too much. Of course, if I can certify universal quantum computation, I can certify all quantum, all the non-universal quantum simulations. But the question is whether, since the target of a certification is lower, well, there should be some simpler technique to certify that. And this is the 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 the, the, the focus of the rest. Of the rest of the talk, so um, this the, 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 by simpler I mean to uh, I refer to non-interactive tests, and uh, and again so here we have well now the untrusted quantum prover so he's 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 still quantum here but now we give uh, now now we we fix Arthur to be classic so this is classical asterisk here so by the, by this I mean now well I I allow him to have uh, classical computing capabilities, and as quantum resources, I just give him single particle measurements, right? So that's 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 as classical as 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 it can get for quantum certification. Without quantum measurements, you cannot do anything quantum, right? There, there should be some measurement at some point, but this is as classical as it can get. That's why I refer to classical asterisks, and uh, and uh, yeah, of, and this is of course the similar mindset to 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 interactive proofs, but with a single quantum interaction, namely the fact that Merlin will send him some quantum state and he will, and, and Arthur will measure. Um, so, so typically he sends some uh, description of, of the target state and the number of, of, of preparations that he wants. And almighty magician Merlin with his magic ball prepares the, the, the required state and sends, in, and sends the required amount of copies of the state to him and he measures. Uh, this involves no restriction on the type of quantum noise, or so the preparation should be totally unknown, except for the fact that typically, or, or for all the examples known, we demand that the preparations that the magician uses are IID, so independent and identical. Um, uh, what is the D? Independent and identical? Huh? Distributed, thanks. Independent and identically distributed preparations. So, which accounts essentially for saying that. Um, there's no entanglement, so Arthur here, so let's say that I focus and I say that I have n particles, right? So Arthur here can make single particle measurements on only n particles, so each time the magician sends him an, sends him an n particle state, and then on the second run he sends him another, and this assumption tells you that we don't allow the, the, the magician to entangle, to, to send him like one preparation and in the next preparation something that is entangled with the first preparation, that's not allowed. I mean. It, 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 the magician could, in principle, he could do that, but we don't know, we don't have efficient techniques to 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 make certification if you assume that, right? So, but this is of course not a big deal. I mean, in, in experience, so for experimentalists, you, you they 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 do they do proceed IID in experiment. They, they they do prepare things independent. They make independent and identical preparations of their of their state, right? Um, so, yeah, so. 
So definition. So any. So I will be using the practical approach, right? Actually, you can. If I have time, I will mention that you can actually show that if you if you certify in this sense, then you can also certify in the more robust sense because due to continue to arguments. But for the sake of simplicity, let's define certification in the practical approach, in which you say that any preparation raw p with fidelity larger than a threshold is a valid preparation of the target state. That's a, that's that's the terminology that I, that, that I'll be using, and then. Uh, we define a certification test tau, um, so a non-interactive certification test for rho t with sample complex complexity c0. If for any c larger than c0, then the following thing happens. So a certification test is a machine that has inputs, settings, and, and outputs. Right? So the settings is, well, uh, how stringent my certification will be today. So uh, today I will want some threshold fidelity that's higher or lower, or I will allow for a maximum failure probability. So certification involves statistical statements, and, uh, and these statistical statements always have a probability of failure. So it's not deterministic, right? But I can put this alpha as high as I want, in principle. And uh, so these are the settings of my machine. And then the inputs of my machine are the preparations, right? They come one by one. They can, so, so this machine can only measure one preparation at a time. You don't have power to measure uh, C times N uh, particles uh, states. And, uh, and yes, yeah, so we say that, that this machine tau is a certification test for this given rho t if when um, the fidelity of rho p with rho t is equal to one, then it outputs the green light, the green light and when f is smaller than ft, it outputs the red light. That's what I define as a certification test. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sim in principle, it's a simple machine. And, um, and, uh, and then we say, well, any preparation, any preparation of row p that passes this test is a certified prepar preparation of row t. Right? So notice one thing is a valid preparation, and another thing is a certified preparation. Right? I will never know. I mean, so let's say here the most important thing is that this test does not does not accept with a high probability that it does not accept states in this red region. We sort of tolerate that we sacrifice a little bit of of, of valid states. So so if you want to, we we accept that some valid states are rejected, but we don't tolerate that invalid states are accepted. Why? Because by that we guarantee that whenever something passes the test, then you are sure with high probability that it's not in the red region right so um, so um, yeah so then what we need actually so 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 this test and so then the, the con I mean you see that we, with that criteria criterion then the fear of merit for the accept re this reject decision must be a lower bound to the fidelity that's what I, that's what I was say what, what I was saying in the beginning we don't need to exactly estimate the, the, to, exact, to estimate the exact value of the fidelity. So we need a lower bound to the fidelity, which has the following property, that if the, if the preparation is perfect, then the, the bound should be tied, in the sense that if I prepare a perfect preparation, this bound should be equal to the fidelity, and since it's the perfect preparation, the fidelity takes the value 1. Right? So these are, with, with the definition that I showed in the previous sli slide, this drives us uh, directly to this type of, of estimation problem, right? So we don't, well, the aim of certification is not to, so at the least you can ask, it's not the fidelity, it's not the entire state, you need to estimate a lower bound to the fidelity that has this extremality property of saturating the, the, the bound when the preparation is perfect. Um, and then, um, well, uh, then, then the accept, reject, Decision is simple now. You say so. Any so Arthur will give some will with him will make measurements and he will come out with an estimate f star of f, and this will always have some uh, additive error, right? So I mean he will do some estimation on a finite sample. This will always necessarily have some some additive error epsilon, and then what he does is well, since he he knows that he has some error epsilon, he accepts only states that so he accepts preparation such that f star is not above ft, but is above ft plus this error epsilon. With this, he guarantees 
that 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 the in let's say he, with with the, with this he covers himself from 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 the fact that he has a finite error estimation, right? With this with this uh, criterion, you fulfill the two defining properties of our certification test: that when f when the real fidelity is equal to one, then this extremality base lower bound is also equal to one, and then your estimation your estimated value should be at least. Uh, um, um, lower, or e larger or equal than one minus epsilon, and this uh, is larger than the fidelity threshold plus epsilon that you put here. And uh, when f is more than f t, then so when capital F is more than f t, then then lowercase f is also smaller than f t, and then your estimate should, I mean, in the worst case, it can be as high as f t plus epsilon, and you reject everything that lies below. So, so this is very simple. Um, so there are at least, or as far as I know, there are at least two families which relate to each other of, of estimation techniques that use extremality based fidelity lower bound. So that's what I'm going to show next. So the first one, um, so as I said, is um, uh, witnesses of the ground states. That's 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 the way we could call them. So first of all, I need some def some simple definition. So local frustration free Hamiltonians. So Given a Hamiltonian, so I write it as h hat, and here I have the, the sum of interaction terms h i that go from one to n, right? Where n is the number of particles, mm, and and this Hamiltonian has a ground state phi zero such that it has a zero energy, right? So I set the energy of the ground state as zero, right? This is this is this is not no, this is to, without loss of generality. So then we say that the Hamiltonian is k local if for all the interaction terms then, so if each interaction terms acts non-trivially on at most k sites, right? So that's what I, that's what I call a local Hamiltonian. It doesn't act, there are there there are no interaction terms that act globally on all the on all the on all the particles involved. We say that it's short range if these k sites are neighboring, right? And we say that it's gapped if there is a spectral gap delta e, which is necessarily strictly larger than zero, between the ground state and the first excited states. And otherwise, we say that it's gapless or critical. This is a terminology that comes from condensed matter physics. Um, and then we say that it's frustration-free if uh, it minimizes also the energy of each interaction term individually. Right, so phi zero, we know that, so I, I started saying that it's the ground state of H, but we say that it's frustration-free if it's also the ground state of each term individually. Right, so it minimizes locally the the energy of each interaction term, and um, and uh, and well, we say that the ground state is unique if it's unique. So if the fact that it's the ground state implies that, so if you if there's any state that has energy zero, then it has to be phi zero, and it's degenerate if there are at least two or more ground states. And finally, we refer to H as the parent Hamiltonian of of phi zero, right? So with this definition, so people have shown, have sh I mean, the, 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 this, this, this Hamiltonians are special because essentially, so up to some uh, some some technicalities, so, so up to some technical conditions that I will not talk about today, but that, that are satisfied by all, essentially all MPS. Uh, people show that MPS is so so any MPS is a unique ground state of a local gap frustration-free Hamiltonian, and then there are the extensions of MPS that I didn't define, but some people may know. Uh, here um, to two dimensions, the PEPs, that are the unique ground states of local frustration-free Hamiltonian. So here perhaps it's not gapped, but uh, it's local and frustration-free. And furthermore, people even show that there, 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 there are always approximations to every gap short, gap local Hamiltonian uh, that are gap local and frustration-free, right? It might not be so easy to find this approximation, but in principle this exists. Anyway, so what, why is this special? For, so why do we care about this in a, in a quantum certification talk? Well, because if, so before I wrote Hamiltonian in terms of the local interaction terms, but I can also expand it in, the, in, in, its, in its eigenbasis, right? So where En are the eigenenergies, and here I have the, 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 the eigenstates, and now the summation goes from zero to Dn minus one, right? So we have exponentially many eigenstates, and, uh, and then, uh, if you, you know, this is a very simple uh, operator bound which tells you that, well, 
if the Hamiltonian is the sum of some eigenstates, and since they are eigenstates, they are complete, and one can expand the identity operator in terms of those eigen, in terms of, the, of that eigenbasis, then you can see immediately that if the Hamiltonian is gapped, then this 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 inequality should be satisfied, right? Because here the the, the initial so E zero the, the the ground state energy was set to zero, and E one the, the, the energy of the first excited state, I said that it should be gapped, so it should be larger or equal than a given, than a given gap delta E. So then it's easy to see that, that, that this equality holds, right? So here, the, 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 the identity is the, super, is, let's say, is the convex combination of, of, of these eigenstates all accompanied by a coefficient one, and the Hamiltonian is all accompanied by coefficients that are zero or larger than delta t, right? So then it's, it's trivial to see this equality, right? So it's an extremity-based fidelity uh, uh, operator bound, not, not fidelity bound. But from that, we can get a fidelity lower bound because, of course, here is the, uh, this is our, so if we take, I mean, if, if, if we're able to, to let's say, if, if, if our target state is this phi zero, is the ground state of, of this Hamiltonian, then using this equality and taking the trace on both sides, sorry, using this inequality and multiplying by rho p, the preparation, taking the trace at both sides, we can see that we get the following fidelity uh, lower bound where the Hamiltonian acts as the witness for its own ground state, right? So this is, this, this is, this is, this is, this is kind, of, kind of elegant, it's very elegant, very nice, it's very simple indeed. And you see that it satisfies the, uh, the, 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 the defining conditions that we wanted of the extremality based fidelity lower bound because we want it to be tight when the preparation is perfect. And of course, when rho p is equal to rho t, then if rho p is equal to, to rho t, then this trace will give zero because rho t is chosen as the ground state and then the ground state has energy zero and then this will give you one, right? So it, it saturates the bound when the preparation is perfect. So this is a, the, a family of, of, of extremality based fidelity lower bounds. And, uh, and, uh, and, and further, well, okay, this is nice, it's fully general, but I mean, can we measure that efficiently? So that's, that's the whole point. And now, and now you see that when, when the Hamiltonian is of the form that, that we discuss, that it's frustration free and local, um, then, then, I mean, you don't even need to, I mean, you can estimate this trace simply by looking only at the reduction. So let's say that, a, so I said that HI acts on K contiguous neighboring sites if you want to. So then all I need is to estimate, if you want to, I, I need to estimate only the, the I, I want to, I mean I need to do tomography on only K contiguous, K contiguous sites here, then the next ones, then the next one, or not even tomography, I don't need to reconstruct the whole state, I just need to, to make the measurements necessary to estimate the expectation value of each local interaction term individually. This is, this is I don't need to reconstruct the whole state for that. So. So yeah, so only 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 information about the reductions is required. So this is the nice thing, and this is due to this property of frustration freeness that I was saying. Um, well, uh, then um, then the, see, yeah. So this is tight and requires only uh, expectation values of the of the local interaction terms. But of course, well, one has to know the parent Hamiltonian. This this in practice happens when when you have some MPS. But it's it's not always it's it's not always the case. In particular, in continuous variable scenarios, this is very unfriendly. So people have started to develop uh, continuous MPS, but um, it's not but it's not so clear how to how to do something like that there. So the other scenario that I want to talk about for, for extremality base, fidelity lower one is uh, uh, is. Um, Let's say for quantum certification of photonic technologies, right? So this, this the, the, the previous slides referred to qubits, if you want to, and then we can do something similar for photon for photonic uh, state preparations. So recently we wrote a paper uh, where, where where we were able to certify the following classes of of target states, right? Which are not which are not uh, uh, let's say it's, uh, this is not an MPS here. So I mean. There are three classes of, of target states that we're interested about. Uh, we're interested of here, which uh, which we can which we can classify into this with this diagram, right? So rho t. So there are three classes that I call the, the so Gaussian states. So this is C G, and then linear optical network states, which is this L O, and then uh, post-selected linear optical network states, right? In which so here you have 
the same preparation as in the linear optical network state, but then you apply some measurements on some subset of modes that you call the ancillas, and depending on this, on the outcome of this measurement, you prepare a different state on the rest of the of the modes, which you call, which you now identify as the system modes. So here, the the unitary can be Gaussian, and and you input all states. So any Gaussian state can be prepared from the vacuum vacuum applying a Gaussian unitary, and of course this Gaussian unitary should involve some squeezing, because otherwise it's a, it's a, it's a passive unitary, and a passive unitary acting on the vacuum gives you the, the vacuum. So for this class to, to be non-trivial, then the, the, the Gaussian unitary should be active, uh, should, should have some squeezing or some displacement. But here in practice, in experiment, so here the situation is different. From the M modes that I have, I populate N of them initially in a Fox state with population one, with one photon each. And the rest of them, I, 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 I set them to zero, to the vacuum. So now here it makes sense to apply a passive unitary because the input is not the vacuum, and indeed that's what people do in lab. Essentially, well, linear optics is all about that. And, uh, and well, at the output, I have my target state, rho t. So this, this state with uh, this M mode state with uh, N photons, each one distributed one by one in a, in a different mode, uh, I, I, I use the nota this notation 1n, right? So this ket notation 1n. And then finally, well, this, this is what I was saying here. So um, this is the same, the same preparation as, as in the linear optical network state, except for the fact that here I make some measurements. For instance, I make measurements in the Fox state basis on the ancillas. So this a, this a here refers to the ancillas. And this p of na given rho t, so rho t is the output of the linear optical network, and on top of that I make the measurement, and this is this 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 p n a of rho t is the probability of success. Probability that when I make a Fox state measurements on the ancillas, I obtain this outcome, right? Because that's what happens when you make uh, when you make post-selected preparations in the lab. You, you, you prepare something, you, ma you make measurements on some, on some ancillas, and with a given probability you obtain one outcome, which is perhaps the outcome that you're interested at, and for that outcome you look at the, you look, you look at the target state of, of the system. Um, so this is interesting because with this covers more, more or less everything that's, 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 well, not everything, but a large part of, large part of, 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 the, of the current experimental setups, right? So Gaussian squeeze, non-Gaussian, on-chip photonic simulations. Uh, I mean, this, is, this goes in the direction of boson sampling also, or, or quantum walks, and, uh, and also photonic qubit encodings. So, so th this technique does not necessarily apply only to, bosonics, to bosonic states. So there are, there are for instance, sch uh, schemes. So the, the most famous one is the KLM scheme for quantum computation, in which you encode a qubit into two modes, and you make linear. You start with a Fox state. You make linear optical network states, and then you make Fox state measurements. It's precisely this setup. Of course, I'm not able. Uh, I'm not saying that we are able to efficiently certify KLM universal quantum computing because we will see that the scaling with the number of photons and the number of measurements is not so nice, right? But the, the but the uh, the type of states, the families of states that we can certify are are of the, are of this type. Um, so, well, again, so here now we have, so this is the, 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 the target state is written in general. So, so if I restrict to the first two classes without post-selection, so the target state is written like this, and then the fidelity takes this form, and of course I can, I can swap these unitaries around and put them into the preparation. So I move to a representation in which, to, to a Heisenberg representation with respect to U dagger. Remember that the certifier knows who this unitary is, because this is a unitary that defines the target state. What is unknown here is the preparation row P, right? So the certifier, so I mean here you move to this Heisenberg representation and, uh, and furthermore, you know, well, I mean you can also swap around the A daggers that define your state 1N, right? So, one, so this state 1N can be thought of as a bunch of, 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 of A dagger operators applied to the vacuum and, uh, and then the fidelity, so if I take this expression, I can swap this productory of, 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 of A dagger operation, operators into, into, the, into, the, into the tilde preparation. And now I define this, this operator, which is not a state. It might not be normalized, but it's positive semi-definite. So it's, it's, it's a positive operator, right? But it's not a state in the sense that uh, its, normaliz its normalization can change due to this thing. 
But it doesn't matter because then I will undo this thing and it will come back. This is just to use now the same type of inequalities that, that I showed in the slides of, of Hamiltonian witnessing of, of ground states. Now I use something similar. Instead of looking at the Hamiltonian, I, I, I look at the number operator. So n, when, when, when I refer to hat n without any subindex, I refer to, so this means the total number operator of all the n, of all the m modes. And then I use, then we can use again the extremality base uh, operator bound and the fact that this row p n tilde is positive and then, well, uh, from this bound and, t and multiplying by rho p tilde n and taking the trace, you get trivially this, this fidelity lower bound. Of course, now um, we have to see who these guys are, right? So, I mean, if you undo, so now remember that now, so uh, what, what I do from here to here, what I do is simply to go to, to, to back again all the operators say and I daggers and to, and to apply them now to n. And you know how to do that because you know the commutations, commutation rules between n, a, and a dagger, right? So, so from here to here, I, 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 I grouped all the, all, the, all the a daggers into the preparations. And now from here to here, I, I take back again all these a and a daggers into the observable. So this gives a lower bound, which is a nonlinear bound. So n, so remember, so I mean, it has to be clear the distinction, right? Without hat, it's the total number of photons, the, of input photons. This is a property of the, of the target state that you want. And n without subindex, but with a hat, is the total photon number operator. And n with a hat, but with a subindex j, refers to the photon number operator of mode j. Right? So this is a highly nonlinear bound uh, of the, to, to the fidelity in which you have a product tree here of, of the number of operators of each mode uh, over the modes that were, in, the, that were initially populated. Right? Um, and, uh, and I mean, it's easy. To, so for instance, when, when in the Gaussian case, when, 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 the, when the input number of photons is zero, then you can see that this reduces, that this reduces to, this, um, to, to this bound. Um, so again, uh, it's an extremality UA. It's, 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 extre it's extremal in the sense that, um, that, oh no, well, yeah, so first of all, yeah, so I, I mean, ah, yeah. So, so we still have a tilde here, which refers to the, to the Heisenberg representation of the preparation. But this is not what the certifier gets, right? The certifier gets the preparation, and he doesn't have the quantum capability to apply this UU dagger, because that, that's exactly the, the circuit that the prover has. So then we have to go back. I mean, now, now I undo. So I, I, these unitaries that were hidden here in this row P tilde, I put them back again into this, uh, into this observable. And now we define some N tilde operators, which is simply the Heisenberg representation of the number of operators with respect to U dagger. Um, and yeah, so this is tight in the sense that when the pre preparation is perfect, it gives you, it, this lower bound gives you one. And here I showed the simplest case when initially you have one photon per mode or zero photons per mode, but you can actually, you can actually, um, you can actually uh, derive it in a more general, in a more general concept of, of trivial input fog base states with more than one photon per, per mode. And, uh, and well, it's a fidelity lower one, right? So I mean, this, this, this could have some, inter some interest in its own right, apart from the field of quantum certification. Now, uh, what's happening is that this observable that now we have to estimate is actually, so I mean, it's, uh, it can be written in the following form, where I have now introduced these operators n sub i supra n, where, where, which, which is where I have this product right here. And, uh, and these operators fulfill the following property. So first of all, they are all positive and commuting. They commute am a bit among, the, among themselves. And then we know that for the ta if the preparation is perfect, then the trace of f hat with respect to the perfect preparation gives you one because it saturates the bound. And then one can also show that the trace of this guy here for perfect preparations is also one. And the trace of, for perfect preparations, the trace of each of these operators gives zero. And, uh, and furthermore, if the preparation is, is not perfect, if you have an arbitrary preparation that is different to the target, to the, ah, here's the typo, it should be a t here. Uh, so if the preparation is not perfect, then these operators uh, give something larger than zero. So this is so we conclude that these these um, these operators are, are what, what is called 
so the, the nullifiers of, of the state. Um, so nullifier operators were introduced in the context of Gaussian uh, quantum information, so essentially for, for Gaussian cluster states. So you, you have an M-mode state, and you have M operators that are called the, the nullifier operators, and that have the property that if you apply those operators into your target state, they all give you zero. And if, they apply, if you apply them onto any other state, they use something different from zero. So that if you have a, a, a some unknown state, but you know that it gets nullified by all the M nullifiers, then you're sure that it's, your, that it's the state that you wanted. So this is essentially what's going on here. I mean, we const in, the, in the end, we, we have, I mean, without, without, without really wanting it, we have introduced nullifier for non-Gaussian class for, for non-Gaussian target states. So the nullifier formalism was developed for Gaussian cluster states, and 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 here we see that that we get non-Gaussian state nullifiers. That's the whole. I mean, it's a, it's an interesting observation. And of course, with that, you can now rephrase things in terms of parent Hamiltonians witnessing uh, witnessing the target state, right? So I mean, if I have these nullifiers, I can write a Hamiltonian which gap, local, frustration free, and furthermore commuting in the terms that the, the non-interacting terms commute also. I mean, it's, it's just a way of seeing these results in terms of the older Hamiltonian witnessing uh, scenario that I was showing. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm getting close to the end already, so people are falling asleep. And um, um, so yeah, so how how to measure this? I mean, the whole thing, yeah. So this is very elegant, but I mean, we. I, I'm I, in the beginning. I sold. I sold you that, that I would. I was going to show you things that can be measured in the lab, and uh, and to do that, to measure it, to measure that efficiently, because I mean, the bound. This bound. Well, you know, it has some number of operators. It looks like I will have to go to the lab and measure number of detection on each on each photons, and then there are super non-local correlations. Okay, so how how do how do how can we measure that efficiently? So to do that, we move to phase space quadrature representation, in which each mode uh, has two uh, quadrature operators asso associated Q and P with the canonical commutation relationships, and then I can define a whole vector of quadrature operators, right? In which I say, well, I have I have this hat R, this this vector R, whose uh, whose odd components are the Qs of each mode, and whose even components are the are the Ps of each mode, and then. Of course, this 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 operator satisfies these identities, right? So the number operator of mode J is equal to Q J squared plus P J squared minus one half, and then the same thing holds for the total number, for the total photon number operator, which is in the end uh, this this vector R squared minus M over two, right? So I, I I'm taking the inner product between R and itself here, this this R squared here, uh, and with that, well, you can you can you can you can now express Instead of having the number, the number representation, you move to the phase space representation, and now, well, what was tilde is still tilde in the Heisenberg in the Heisenberg picture. So I have done nothing. I I simply re re rewrote that in in phase space quadratures. But why is that advantageous? Because for Gaussian transformations, as the one we consider, so remember that this the target states are not necessarily Gaussian because you input Fox states, but the evolution is Gaussian, and the, and when the evolution is Gaussian. Then um, phase space quadratures transform as classical phase space quadratures, right? And this 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 can be tracked and followed very very efficiently because the, uh, the transformation is governed by a symplectic matrix that was also mentioned yesterday by Professor Josa in the context of of, of qubits and 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 qubits uh, and 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 yeah. So I mean you have a, you have in this representation the transformation from R to R tilde is simply just some matrix. Multiplication essentially, and matrix multiplication is something that you can do very efficiently. So this is a real. So the symplectic matrix. If you have m modes, the symplectic matrix is a square real matrix of size 2m times 2m. So this you, you can you can follow that very efficiently, and uh, and if this happens, then each component of the vector R is a linear combination of at most two. So so each R tilde is at most a linear is a linear combination of at most 2m r without the tilde, right? If the transformation is simply a matrix represent, so if going from r to r tilde is simply multiplied by a square matrix of size 2m times 2m, then the worst thing that can happen is that each r tilde is a linear combination of all the other r's without the tilde. You go, you go from the Schrodinger to the Heisenberg picture, 
And the worst thing that can happen is that you 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 have a linear combination of 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 the untilled uh, of the untilled operators, right? But if that happens, then our observable of interest is at most is a linear combination of at most this many two n plus one body quadrature correlators, and this many is a polynomial number, right? For n fixed, so when when the number of input photons is fixed, then this is the, the, this. This tells me that I can estimate. I can instead of me, so I mean I can estimate this this f in this tilde representation by measuring only correlators of many. Bo so these are many body correlators between different quadrature operators of different modes. But I can do that with a with a polynomial number of them. Uh, and this this is essentially our goal. So. So these these transformations that are called affine linear maps, these symplectic transformations are highly efficient to, to highly efficient to handle. And furthermore, now we see that we can do the whole detection with homoline detection, which is much nicer than number detection because homoline measurements are are are, are easy, easily implementable in the lab than number measurements. And there and and furthermore, I mean here I say well. Well, as I said, I mean, in the worst case, it can happen that is that each R J is a linear R J tilde is a linear combination of two J's without the tilde. But in practice, you have your circuit, you have your target, you, you know which one which one is your target state, and you know who this symplectic is. So this is information that you have that allows you to super super optimize this bound. That's something that we discuss in the paper. That I mean, in pre so so with 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 you know the circuit that creates your target state, and you can use that information to optimize this polynomial much 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 more. But in the worst case, we see that it's already polynomial, which was which is the whole the whole goal of the of the of the story. Uh, well, of course, the scaling is exponential with the number of input photons, right? So actually, I don't know if there is hope. To have uh, efficient certification when you when you when you when you let n scale arbitrarily with m, if you use non-interacting non-interactive tests, that's that's an open problem. But uh, I don't I don't know if there's much. I mean I don't know. This is this is one of the open problems that the, the one of the big open problems I would say. Anyway, so. Um, yeah, so we have theorems that guarantee that not only the the, the 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 number of observables that you have to measure is polynomial, but also the total sample complexity is polynomial, meaning the total number of preparations is polynomial. And I'm not gonna um, I'm not gonna show technicalities. And um, and the last thing, the, the uh, well, I mean, I I sort of forgot one of the classes that um, that I was that I was advertising in the beginning. So the the, the post-selected class, right? And here it's a similar story, except that the the extremality based uh, fidelity lower bound changes. So if you had, remember that the target state here before the uh, the measurements on the ancilla is the same output target state that you have in the linear optical network class. So then we use for this we use the same bound, but we project onto the uh, ancilla state that we want here and normalize by the probability of success. This is just to just to set, just to I'm not going to show the whole details. It's all very very similar, uh, except that the, the 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 bound changes. And of course, you only need to make measurements. So I mean, after uh, is given. So if you want to, I mean, Merlin has this part of the of the circuit, right? So Merlin also has the measurement on the on the on the ancilla. So all that Arthur gets is this part of the state here. And so therefore all he can do is to make measurements on quadrature correlations on this on the on on, on this on this uh, part of the system. And this is essentially what happens here because the this this operator F involves quadratures also here, but then they are projected out by this measurement. And then what survives here is just quadrature correlation measurements on this on this part on the on, on the system on the subs on the system uh, reduce reduce state. So, uh, well, I'm not going to bore bore you too much. I'm, I'm just going to tell you that uh, due to simple continuity arguments, you can show that if you have an efficient certification test with a certification defined in the in the practical notion, then you can extend it to 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 certification in the robust sense and it's still it's still efficient this can be done i mean there always exists of course it's just a matter of how large this gap is of course but we we quantify those gaps in the in in in, in that paper and 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 we can always we can always show i mean one can always show that there is there is a finite region inside of here 
that uh, of, of, of finite size, finite volume, that gets necessarily accepted. So this is what we call robustness against um, uh, fidelity, experimental fidelity deviations. And uh, and yeah, well, so with that, I would like to come to the conclusions. So so yeah, I mean, we talked about the general mindset and different paradigms of certification. And then we, 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 I showed examples of two ways of certifying. So the, the interactive ones, in which the quantum prover, um, so quantum prover interactive proof, so the, the, the prover uh, has BQP resources and the, and the certifier is almost classical. And we talked about two different ways of doing that, but that essentially achieve equivalent things. And then the non-interactive certification test, so here, the crucial thing is this extremality-based fidelity lower bounds, and I showed two examples. So, so, so the, 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 those like Hamiltonians as witnesses of their own ground states, and, and then this certification of, of photonic outputs uh, that applies to Gaussian and non-Gaussian quantum information and bosonic quantum simulations, and that can be applied also to qubit encoding. Right? Uh, this required the yeah. So we had to introduce non-Gaussian state nullifiers, and we go to phase state treatment. And um, and uh, yeah, and it can be done robustly also. So I think so. I don't know. So this slide I prepared last night at 3 a.m. in the morning. So, but I, my brain was uh, uh, good enough to at least identify some uh, interest in open problems. So some are feasible, and some of wo some of them are indeed a work in progress. Here, those here, let's say. So I mean, so all that we did for the bosonic case can, can of course, be translated to the free fermionic case. Uh, there is a parallelism between Gaussian operations in bosons and and free uh, Hamiltonian, free, bos free fermionic Hamiltonians. And then one can think of well, <coughs> apply this to analog uh, uh, spin chain quantum simulations. Or one can even think of applying certification tools in other scenarios. So, for instance, crypto. Crypto is a typical crypto is a typical scenario where you where you want to certify things, unless you are device independent. Uh, typically, I mean, there's uh, there's Alice and Bob, and you you want to be sure that you that you have the correct preparation of your state in order to to be able to 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 draw some some data from which you can distill a key. Uh, so, but then there are the like, like the really, really interesting problems, right? So, notice that, I mean, uh, two examples that I showed for which you can do non-interactive, so for which you can do non-interactive certification efficiently, are essentially these cases of local gap frustration-free Hamiltonians, which in the end reduces more or less to certifying MPS states, which are efficiently scribable for finite bond di dimension, and then I showed you this thing of for the photonic certification, right? And also there, the description of your final state is, is efficient. I mean, you have an input Fox state that you know, and then I showed you that, I mean, there is this symplectic uh, formalism that allows to describe your state efficiently. So I'm not saying, I mean, this is still interesting because in, as, I, as I said in the first lecture, it happens that, you know, you go to the lab, even if you know what's your target state, even if you can write it down and work out the details, I mean, in theory, you go to the lab and you have, you, you have an n-particle state who lives in, a, a, in an exponentially large Hilbert space, and you still need to see if that preparation looks like the target state that you want. So this still is it's, it's, it's even if the target state is efficiently scribable classically, the certification is still a valid, uh, not a relevant question, right? But the real target of quantum certification is to be able to say something, and hopefully to say something with non-interactive schemes, or, or perhaps schemes with a single quantum interaction. So notice that here uh, the definition that I'm using of non-interactive schemes is a scheme in which Arthur just sends a classical input to, to Merlin, namely the, state pre the target state preparation and the number of copies that he wants, and then Merlin returns back the, the output. But still, with a single message, if we restrict to a single message interacti interactive scena interacting scenarios, there's still the possibility, I mean, in principle, Arthur could input some quantum state to Merlin, and then Merlin output, uh, return the, the, the quantum output, and, f and perhaps in, th in that first input that, Mer that Arthur sends, he could encode some notion of traps or something similar to what I showed for, for more complex interacting um, uh, tests. But this is the whole, th I mean, 
this is this is the real thing. I mean, so now, for instance, yeah, so time evolutions of of both of Har or Harmy or Fermi Howard models in 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 critical regimes, right? Notice that uh, the problem still makes sense, right? Even though if so, let's, let's suppose I take a both Howard model at, at a critical regime. I don't I don't know how to solve its time evolution. No, it is a non-solvable system. So this doesn't mean that I am not able to indicate Merlin what state I want because the initial, I can describe the Hamiltonian efficiently and tell Merlin, hey Merlin, this is my target Hamiltonian and I want you to give me the ground state, or, sorry, the, the, the evolved state of this Hamiltonian at some time t. So the description, the description of the target is still efficient. It's very simple. I, I, I write down the Hamiltonian and I indicate which real, a real number which indicates the time of the target. This doesn't mean that I am able to write down the ket of the target state, but the problem of certification is still well defined. Now, how to certify that without writing that writing down the ket? This is the real the real big problem of certification. So, for instance, for the photonic technology, so 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 in the photonic case, here we're able to write down to to certify. So, for instance, if you, the people were talking, and, and my, I also myself in the last class were talking about boson sampling. And we cannot certify boson sampling because, first of all, boson sampling uh, is a classical output sampling problem. Namely, you measure in fog basis states, and here we're measuring in, in homoline detection. But apart from that, we're restricted to having an input, uh, uh, an input photon number which is fixed. And this is not what happens in boson sampling. In boson sampling, the number of input photons scales also with the total number of modes. So we're not certifying boson sampling, but we're certifying pre measurement quantum states used in boson sampling with finite with with fixed n right so yeah and finally well this thing of certification complexity classes so i mean uh, in the beginning i said that in 2003 there was like the, the founding paper by john watros where he shows where he studies for instance the 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 the, the class of the classes of problems that can be certified when the prover has unlimited quantum power and the certifier has BQP power, and then we move to scenarios where the certifier is almost classical. So there are many things in between that you can think of. So for instance, namely, okay, what if the prover has a full, a, a, a huge Bose-Howard uh, model simulator, and the certifier has, I don't know, a small Bose-Howard simulator? Can he do something better? So there. Yeah, I mean, perhaps one could even define, instead of computational complexity classes, one could even define certification complexity classes, in which you classify, classify problems not in terms of the difficulty to solve them, but in terms of the difficulty to certify them, right? So, I don't know, these are some perspectives for the fields, and uh, um, so I hope you have learned something um, in these two talks. I thank you for your attention. And also, if somebody's interested in spending some some couple of years in Rio, um, we always uh, we're always uh, receptive about that. And um, and, he, and and somebody should, if somebody's interested, he should contact me. And uh, yeah, with that, I would like to finish. No. Any questions? Today people are, are much more silent. <laughs> you, you mentioned uh, as a perspective, uh, simulation of uh, free Fermi systems and uh, spin chains. Yeah. Would those be like X, Y interactions or match gate interactions and use yeah. so compressed simulation schemes? Yeah, so what we're doing now, there is, a, there is an ongoing project in which um, so you know that there, so I said that there is an equivalence between um, so uh, let's say Gaussian Gaussian evolutions. So we we talked about linear optical circuits and such things. You can think of that as um, as um, let's say a Hamiltonian, which is quadratic in 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 the quadrature operators, and this is what is called like a free bosonic model without interaction. So the Bose-Howard model has quadratic terms. Whenever you have just quadratic terms, then it's, then it's called like a free bosonic model. And then the same thing that we did here can be reproduced for free fermionic models in which you have now A and A dagger operators, but these are fermionic operators and you have a quadratic Hamiltonian. Now, free fermionic models 
are mapped, can be mapped into uh, easing systems or XY spin chains via the Jordan Wigner transform. And then so actually uh, one can do, si one, can, one, one can say similar things for the certification of, of nearest, nearest neighbor uh, quantum. So this would be analog simulations of, of, of uh, spin, of, of, yeah, spin chains. So the, the crucial thing, so we can, I would say that we can certify all, um, all spin chains that are Jordan Wigner equivalent to free fermionic models. More questions? Okay, just wondering. Um, so the, the basic premise, the basic target is always to certify a specific state. So you want to get fidelity with regard to the full state. Is there a useful way in which you can think of certifying some subset of properties of a state without having to certify indeed, the full state. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Yeah, that's, well, uh, thanks for that question. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, I mean, um, so for, for Fermi or Rose Howard simulations, people are not really interested in simulating, in, in getting, in certifying the whole state. Because actually, you go to a cold atom experiment and you cannot do I mean, independently of, of, of the scaling of the resources, you don't have the resource. I mean, it's not so easy to, to measure a complete uh, base, operator basis uh, there. So essentially, in those experiments, all, all you measure is uh, local, let's say, uh, si simple, so for instance, popula uh, yeah, atom population in each well, essentially. So um, there, for, that, for those type of models, actually what, you would do, what people are interested in is just in so order parameters, essentially. Order parameters in condensed matter physics are local observables, essentially. Sometime, sometimes single particle observables or, or sometimes two-body correlators. So it might be the case, there is some hope, because you, know, you, you look at the Rose Howard model at, a, at the critical point, you cannot solve its time evolution, but you, your target is not to certify the whole state. Perhaps you just, you're just happy certifying that the measurements describing the two-body correlators are the correct ones, right? So instead of certifying the whole state, you want to certify two-body reductions, two-body two reduced states of the total state. So on the one hand, the evolution is more complex. You, don't, you can't solve it, but what you want to certify is much, much lower, right? So, so, I mean, there is hope. But of course, since you cannot solve the evolution, it's like, yeah, okay, I want to certify very little of a, st of a difficult state, and so it's, it's this trade-off, right? But, but yeah, this, this is a possibility, yeah. This, this could happen. I mean, actually, this should be exploited, of course. Certification should try to aim, so, yeah. So the other day we were discussing, in the, in the road trip, we were discussing about um, the fermi Howard model, that people say that the ground state of such models could contain information that could help you understand high, high temperature superconductivity, for instance. But this means that you only need to, de to, to detect correlations in the ground state. You don't need to certify the whole ground state, for instance. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Someone else? <laughs> Sorry for asking another question, but... Uh, one question everybody, I mean, many experimenters are interested in is to certify that a state is Gaussian or putting some bounds on how far from Gaussian they yeah. are. Just because there are all these entanglement criteria, for example, for Gaussian yeah. states. Yeah. So uh, can you do something better than just measuring the, the operators and seeing if they, they are Gaussian and the outcomes are Gaussian? Mm, we've, we've been thinking about that. And uh, I don't know how to do that. Because here... Uh, what I can guarantee, so I can guarantee that a given unknown preparation is close in terms of fidelity to a given target Gaussian state. But being close in terms of fidelity to a given Gaussian state does not necessarily imply that your preparation is Gaussian. People, I mean, in, in, in the group in Berlin, there are some people thinking about that problem. And, uh, and you know, you measure uh, photon statistics, and then if your photon statistics is similar to the one you, sp you expect to, to uh, from a Gaussian state, then perhaps you can say something. But I would say that that's an open problem also. And, and, and I don't know if it's... When you, when you use such stringent definitions of certification, so here... Uh, or they were discussing, so we, uh, I refer the term certification for schemes that are unconditional, that do not, do not assume anything of the preparation. 
Then when you have some a priori knowledge of the preparation, then you are benchmarking actually. But so in that in that unconditional sense of certification, I would say that it's not an easy thing to to, to certify that that the state is Gaussian. But I don't know. This is perhaps always just typical problem of lack of imagination. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so it's difficult until it's easy. <laughs> Thank you.